Here we go. Yeah, so this is the first synchronicity. Uh, we're out at the, <laughs> the limits of time and space, okay? Let's start. Lisa, can you? Okay. Um, so we, we're going to uh, begin each one uh, something different with a quote. And uh, today we start, what is of immediate importance is not the future in its temporal and external aspect, but its presence in us. And that, that comes up over and over again. And uh, there are implications and, and uh, elaborations of that. So first, uh, I'm going to talk about Gapser's project, uh, focusing on the fullness of a present, a present which includes a past and birthing of our future. And I'm going to call it future past presencing. Um, and part of that, Gapser's uh, project, uh, part one, was in the integrative exploration. So it's misspelled there. Journal, I think it was in 1994, but it's on the, the website. Um, so two is uh, there's a fullness of the surging present. It, it's really difficult to talk about the integral without getting into some kind of temporality, but uh, we could talk about surging uh, entangled with wishes, which are uh, the future and expectations of the future. And something very important, my master's, uh, my doctor's uh, thesis was in uh, Merleau-Ponty was on Merleau-Ponty, and we'll have to include here the institutions of the past. And, um, and we saw that even in John's work, that the past is just there and present and emerging and surging. Uh, so the, the sec that's really part of the first part. The second part is the role of the future is very relevant in the midst of a second exploration of Gapser's project consciousness, uh, to reconsider structures and how they are a melange or a stew. And this is something I, I started to work on in the last couple of papers that I did. And I want to focus on it here. It's kind of uh, latent and sometimes not latent in Gabser's work, but I'm going to focus on it. And the third part then is, is kind of in this context, then how for, for Gapser and for the integral, it's a lot about the how. So here we're talking about how do we act in what Gapser calls the wakeful presence. And uh, there's a lot packed in there. So we'll go to the next slide. Only those who succeed for whom the present becomes a time-free origin, a perpetual plenitude and a source of life and spirit from which all decisive constellations and formations are completed. So only those will succeed. Um, and I think we, we will come to some of what's happening in the world today. And uh, there's a lot of prophetic material in, in Gapser. So preview based on Gapser's project, uh, coming back again, first, the origin of the future, past and the present, and its origins in Nietzsche. When you look at the footnotes of, uh, integrative explorations, the uh, way in the back, you find that Nietzsche was the first one to talk about the future, the origin of the future and past and the present. And uh, I'll come to that too. Second, gapes are structures of consciousness which describe the phenomenology of the fullness of the present as a blender or a stew. I'm gonna develop that and I'm gonna talk about it in terms of Husserl and Merleau-Ponty and others but I'm gonna talk particularly about this in terms of time, temporality, or John's term, temporics. And the last day, we're gonna consider how we go forth from the future past presencing, what and how much the how falls on the individual. And uh, we could say here that the individual is Jung's individuated self. We're talking about an integration of the self and we'll have to talk a little about that too in detail. So next one. So this is the only place where I have another heading. <laughs> um, will the center hold? And that, that's kind of the, um, 
prophetic view of where we go at the end. What do we do? How do we do it? The crisis we are experiencing today is not just a crisis of morals, economics, ideologies, politics, or religion. It's a crisis of the world and mankind such as has occurred previously only during pivotal junctures. And that's very interesting, junctures of decisive finality for life on earth and for the humanity subjected to them of complete transformation that can only be described as a global catastrophe. And uh, at the time we, we could easily see some of that as present. And again, th this is a uh, part of what I dealt with in, in uh, Gates's project and I'll come back to it. So crisis and consciousness, what is integral and to explore the integrating or the presencing of our consciousness, including the presencing of the future and past and the presencing of the future in this atemporal consciousness. Uh, the integral is atemporal and we need to talk about what that means. An emerging present, a complex constellation of wakefulness. And again, these are some of Gabster's terms. Um, and can we really count on late modern civilization to realize integral awareness? Next slide. In our reflections and the pre presentation, that's a, a Gabesarian term of the past, this makes it present to consciousness. Uh, we shall include the future as latently existing and already present in us. So we begin here with the origin of the future and past and the present. In the invisible origin, Gapeser acknowledges his, his new assessment of the presence, which apart from the past contains also the future events as wishes and uh, recollections from the future coming out of Rilke. I don't go into, he has a long section on, on the different poets and where his sense of the recollections of the future is coming in and, and wishes uh, of the future. But we're, we're going to kind of skip that because it may get picked up by other people and it's not as relevant here. So past and future are part and parcel of an emerging, integrating, lived, wakeful experience. Uh, in Nietzsche's terms, a becoming, but not an arrow of time. This is where we have to talk about time differently. Um, McCunnis. Uh, talks a lot about in his papers on time that we're not looking for a time arrow. We have to get out of a space where there's any sense of a time error, arrow. And that's uh, present in some of the earliest work of St. Augustine. And then even in Husserl, Husserl talks about flow. Uh, we have to talk about a, a fullness of presencing. So Gabeser, the new mutation makes the future present and manifests not in time, but in time freedom. Uh, and yet the unconscious contents can scarcely ever be integrated into the subject in, in their entirety. And I'm noting, I was gonna challenge John on this, that she says can scarcely ever be integrated on Franz into the subject. So that answers my question is that, uh, what I thought is it's a rare event but it does happen. Next one. So we're convinced of the continuous effectuality of the earlier structures in us and incipient um, present uh, effectuality of the so-called future structure. The new psychology initiated primarily by Freud and expanded by Jung demonstrated in their investigations of myth that the mythical attitude continues in us more than just residually. So this is the first reference, a reference to the, the mythic. And again, John was, was pulling this up as he worked through his sculpture. So now we go on to part two, the phenomenology of presencing, the stew of, of temporics, because all of the modes of consciousness, especially in terms of temporality, temporics, are all present in a stew in, in the present. And what's happening in John's sculpture again, brings that all together in a, in a vibrant way. There's a resonance as somebody said, 
uh, to how the different uh, modes and structures come together. So every mode of consciousness is ever present. And uh, here, I think this tripped it off very strongly for me with McConus's paper uh, called Before, um, Before Time Began. And in there, he says, the mythic is ever present and, and very important in today's world. But we'll come back to that again. So yet, be anchored uh, in our, our strictly wakeful being and remaining in the present. Uh, this is how we, we wear, in Gapes's terms, in the integrating, integrating, this is how we wear uh, the present and the future uh, as, as merging, submerging, emerging, just working uh, in, the, in the, the present thing. So living wakeful present thing is a stew or a mix and never some a pure awareness. Uh, if you think about it, we never uh, have a pure awareness just of, of a, a transparency of a seeing through and visioning as McConus says, um, there's so much more and we have to try, find ways and that you'll hear me uh, trying to do that of getting out of the, uh, the visual because it's not just visual, that's part of it, but so much more is integrated from all of the senses and perceptions and, and structurations of civilization and culture and community and uh, we have to take those into account. So finally, mental awareness as inclusion of an experience that is a mythic imagination, uh, our magical dream work, or even archaic unity. So even in mental awareness, uh, there's a mythic which, which is uh, seeping in, uh, a mythic imagination. Imagination is always a part of, of the integral or a magical dream work. Uh, maybe some of you know the uh, Arnie Mendel's dream work and how in everyday life we're constantly dreaming. And even in finally uh, archaic unity. And again, John uh, pulls it all together in a unity. So let's go on here. Uh, Temporix reveals the basic concern of our transitional period coming to grips with all of the temporal forms so far achieved by consciousness. So here we talk about consciousness structures, the, the basic constancies and, and settlements uh, that are present in, in a civilization. Somebody said, culture kind of wanders all over the place, but civilization is what works or what's left over, what, what happens um, that, didn't, that uh, kind of perdures. So uh, in Gapser's work on the, uh, the invisible origin, uh, he, began, he brings in the term at once, and I'll kind of present that, and uh, it will come up again. Origin is time-free, and Husserl, uh, this is the connection between Husserl and Gapser. Gapser says the integral is time-free, or um, we have to make it time-free. Um, and Husserl, and I finally found this, Husserl in his Phenomenology of Consciousness says that, that he has discovered an absolute non-temporal consciousness in which all temporal objects are constituted. So in the archaic, in the origin, uh, we begin with no time. There's an absolute experience that is not yet temporal. Um, and compare this with Gapser, the invisible origin. Origin and presence are an at once, freed from time and freeing ourselves from it. Not a moment, but a fullness of lived experience or wakeful, as he says, uh, presencing. And at once, uh, I have some problems with that because it implies a, an absolute you know, moment here, time, and again, going back to McCunnis, uh, who some of you know is, was one of my major mentors. Um, if you have a, a point in time, then something has to connect it with other points in time. So I have a little problem with that once, unless we understand it as, as this 
fullness of the presence of the moment. Uh, finally, origin is space-time free, absolutely given as undifferentiated and unified experience. Uh, I ask the undifferentiated and unified experience of humans with the world, with the cosmos really, because it's more than just a matter of physical world. In quantum mechanics, it's, it's a constant probability of, of, of being, uh, in quotes, being because phenomenology brackets being. So finally, for gates of the time forms that we know, the all consuming moment of the magical consciousness, the archetypal animated cycles of the mythic and the linear chronology of the rational with consciousness uh, are all here. And uh, this is from a paper by Aaron Cheek, uh, who was president of the Gapes of Society and has done a lot of translations of his poetry and work. Next one. So the quote from the section, uh, this quote from the section on the mythic and Gapes's uh, ever present origin, the natural mythological interpretation, which no doubt still shows here and there some magic residue. So the, the mythic shows some magic residue. We find this kind of tainting of, of one consciousness structure with another, as if the magic was just contaminating the mythic consciousness, just a touch. But we know as, as we think about it, and as we look at John's pulling together of a sculpture, right, that there's so much more there. So this is part two of uh, consciousness structures, and again, focusing on time. The magical may be the source for which archetypes are activated, and, and here's something that we can talk about, but they also taint the mythic with their residue, a stew of consciousness uh, and unconscious. And here I pull back to John Dotson, where he speaks of archaic wounding, and that definitely resonates uh, in the mental and the integral and must be integrated. Mythical thinking, which was uh, pictorial, executed in circles and returned always to itself, was superseded by the mental thinking, which executes a conceptual, purposive, and straightforward thinking directed to, to an opposite. And that's from the invisible origin. Um, that probably uh, Gapser's last uh, major work. And finally, the rational mental is reason plus um, a duality for sure, but also a beginning of perspectivity, opening a way for the integrating field. Um, and as um, Nietzsche was talking about, already a multi-realism, uh, something that goes by, by, beyond and, and by um, perspectivity, multi-perspectivity, and, and McConnus again has called it um, multi-polycentric, multi-centric. Um, the sense that, that there are all these perspectives, but we must be somewhere that encompasses more than the perspectives to see and understand them. So we're doing pretty good for time here. Origin is ever present. It's not a beginning since all beginning is linked with time. And the present is not just the now, today, the moment or the unit of time. It is ever originating an achievement of full integration and continuous renewal. And that's a very interesting word that is constantly renewed uh, as John keeps working on his sculptures. I hope you appreciate that, John. Anyone able to concretize, that is to realize and affect the reality of origin and the present in their entirety supersedes beginning and end and mere here and now. Uh, and again, that was in uh, McCunnis's paper, um, the beginning of time, uh, because he has to realize that um, having a beginning is already temporality. And that, that's what uh, Gapser is talking about here too. So integral is origin and all modes are ever present. Now we begin to talk about the mix more, more definitely. And the integral era is an exemplar of the challenges of how to aware and that's the Gapes are in term to where is to be uh, cognizant and aware is uh, 
at the process of the wholeness of consciousness, the how is seeing through, of noticing concretely, because for Gapser, it's not an idealism, it's a concrete reality that we're living um, in a living streaming present. Um, <clears throat> and transparently, which is becoming time free, a wearing of the whole and of all modes. So integrating is bringing to transparency the wholeness of all modes of consciousness as the future past, presencing, and the how of temporics as, as we are in this presencing of the future and the past. Every structure of consciousness is ever present and our modern era is then the mixing and ultimately the emergence of various stews of consciousness. And again, various, because this is really complex and provides new challenges for how we look at culture and civilization um, and depends on various social cultural civilizational structures, as I'm saying, you know, <clears throat> drink a coffee here. So an intelligent contemporary of unknown name remarked recently, time is in, an invention of, uh, excuse me, time is an invention to prevent that everything happens at the same time. And that's funny, really. Um, and another quote from the invisible origin, the unreality of time does not mean den uh, denial of time. It's denial and uh, would be a flight into timelessness and hence self-renunciation. So looking at these blends of consciousness modes, Temporic blames can happen to us and are also created via disciplines like yoga, meditation, drugs. I mean, just think of, of being on a drug uh, or doing yoga or meditating and how we alter time. We alter the mix of time, the melange, the, the uh, stew, because there are big chunks of <laughs> something in there that, that stick in our craw, right? Uh, and drugs certainly force um, that blend, that, that melange. So consciousness as a stew, a mix of modes of consciousness should include latency, shadows, the less conscious and unconscious. So all of these things are percolating up too, all becoming, as Nietzsche would say, all fields of awareness, as John would say, at all levels and scales of magnitude are the stew of all consciousness modes, but with different blends, different mixes, more of this and that. So finally, the uh, almost the complexity of the blend is as diverse as the weather and as unpredictable. For example, we seem to be experiencing a revenge of the deficient mythic, deficient mythic in our present uh, era. With the rise of authoritarian dictators, the challenge to women's rights, a backlash from those who feel constrained, by the rigor and demands of the mental structure, perhaps e efficient, deficient, or the demands of the integral, which are vast and, and very demanding. Uh, and we'll come back to that. Um, so next slide. The first sentence of the final chapter of EPO, the concretion of the spiritual, Gabes or writes, whatever happens on earth, Man uh, must share the responsibility. All of us must share the responsibility. So here we part three, um, the how of a future past presencing. Uh, Gapser agrees um, and we'll see what he agrees with. And here, for me, the theme that's running through here is Nietzsche, Jung and Gapser. Um, so I don't know if I put it in here. Uh, I think I do, we'll come back to it. So Nietzsche and his obsession with the future as well as the past, uh, our responsibility, he says, we the free spirits who are engaged in creating a healthy community through wearing the best of the Greeks and creating a healthy future. That's kind of uh, not quite Nietzsche, but close. <laughs> Uh, he was very much concerned, and of course, because of his illness, maybe, but he wanted a healthy culture. And he thought that, that at least for a period of time, the Greeks had that. They appreciated that. And that we needed to 
put that into our presencing uh, in the present and, and bring about uh, a better future. Um, but we'll see how that, that goes. And how the decadence of modernity uh, is again a Nietzsche phrase, consists in a decay of power to maintain complex unities in the exuberance of life, being uh, pushed back into the smallest forms and so reducing former holes to rubble and to chaos. We must be proactive because these things, we're seeing them happen today. And these are the, the parallels between Gabser's uh, first work, The Ever-Present Origin, and today, the parallels are, are phenomenal. We're going through one of those really upsetting periods, he would say, of turmoil. And if, when he was writing, uh, Ever-Present Origin came out, 4950, and he was just fresh from the, the war, and from having to escape the war, many of you know, and uh, just from, from so much that was, was going on uh, and had gone on during his lifetime. And so here too, we're, we're seeing all of this reducing the holes to rubble, to chaos, and, and we must act. How is the, is the question. So Nietzsche's whole philosophy was about building about constructing, attending a garden of life, doing now what would be the best for humanity. He was first, or one of the first, I can't say absolutely the first, to present a Euro cosmopolitan community. And finally, he thought that, that we should eventually move to a global community, but it was based on that, that Euro cosmopolitan way of thinking, Gabster would say, the mental, uh, the efficient mental consciousness, which is building. So, so uh, Leonard Shalane, um, somebody I've been reading uh, recently, gives a rich and ironic and telling image of our present past future unfolding as related to our technological evolution. He says, when trying to gauge the effects of our age, we might find ourselves trapped in the center of a spinning washing machine. It's difficult for anyone so positioned to appreciate that the clothes tumbling violently about are becoming cleaner. And uh, I, I find that just so amusing. And I called it the laundromat because there's not just one washing machine tumbling everything around today. It's a laundromat. <laughs> and there are uh, many situations where much is tumbling. So going back to the structures of consciousness and then in the events of the modern world, all tumbling around chaotically, all is not settled. Um, and we would think of that as, as what a civilization is about. A civilization is, is what is settled and, and, and the structures that, are, that hold, right? Um, will the center hold? We come back to that. And yet as we aware the integral, we also know there is no panacea and I forget who was, uh, I was uh, listening to that, that presented that, but no real escape from our stake in the future. Some things might come out of the tumbling chaos cleaner or more conscious, uh, more integral and less latent. The Greek uh, seeks a world that is creating and living inter, oh, excuse me, um, getting tired here, Gabe, sir, seeks a world that is creating and living integrally. So, um, so Shalane, uh, again, author of The Goddess versus the Alphabet, I forgot to bring the title in before, about the conflict between the word and the image, argues about the medium of the alphabet versus the reign of the goddess. In Gabserian thinking, this would be the, the tensions between the mental and the mythic. And, um, and often today, uh, the constructive mythic is being overwhelmed at times, excuse me, at times and in places by the deficient and uh, probably reinforced by the deficient mental. So consciousness as a settled consciousness structure gave Sir Wares the broadest structures of human evolving civilizations, have some broad structures such as, such as a sense of morality, uh, 
civilizations tend to provide a framework for a certain morality that and, and what is constant and important to, to hold up uh, in that, that society. And we think of civilizations then as settled structures, complex unities. And then I remembered settled law in our current Supreme Court. What is really settled? At times, civilizations are laundromats and the wash cycle plays out over centuries, maybe millennia, uh, certainly. So uh, one thought from the conclusion of the, uh, the uh, alphabet versus the goddess, quoting Sophocles, nothing vast enters the life of morals, mortals without a curse. And uh, we could take that to heart is that, uh, I'm gonna focus here uh, about that on, on technology particularly, because I think that's one, one part of the modern world that, that is, can be a curse. And, and has been uh, at times. So whether we get a future that is beautiful and just or flawed and dystopian, or whether civilization ends and we go and we get no future at all, but that depends in a significant part on what we, uh, what we do today. And that's a recent article by uh, William McCaskill, uh, The Case for Long, long uh, long-termism, which is uh, people are beginning to think more about, and, and we'll come back to that with Nietzsche, is we have to think in terms of, of planning for, for the long-term and not just for the immediate future. And of course, that's problematic to be sure. So the arguments for civilizational turmoil, turmoil there's one possibility, and that is in terms of technology as a disruptor, as McLuhan's friend and colleague, John uh, Culkin put it, we shape our tools and thereafter they shape us. And oh, do they shape us at times. Schlein uh, says the medium of the alphabet versus the reign of the goddess in that, that uh, sense. In Gapesarian thinking, this would be the tensions between the mental and the mythic. So the, the alphabet versus the goddess is the mental versus the mythic. Um, and I think uh, Schlein is talking mostly about the goddess uh, as efficient uh, mythic. And uh, we often talk today about the mental as the deficient mental. Uh, McLuhan's notion of the, the disruptions of new technologies, the modern era of communication media is really change on steroids. There's, there's so much going on and and we don't have control of it yet. We don't have an input. And finally, uh, turmoil can uh, lead to mutual aid. Uh, Deanna Creasel, a scholar of utopian literature and author of the Dr. Waffelbaum blog, that the phenomenal title, suggests that human beings tend to band together in loosely improvisational communities of mutual aid. And there she's saying that when we go through these periods of washing machines and laundromats, that perhaps that brings us all back together in community uh, with more uh, integrality, with more gravitas to, to put, the, put our foot to the pedal, you know, and get something going. Next one. Uh, Eddington, who uh, Gapes here again quotes, sees the world of at once still as a vis-a-vis -vis since he encounters its events. Uh, but Cezanne participates in it. And I think that's very phenomenal for all of us. And, and John's play in the garage with his, his sculpture. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm following John, so I have to say this. But um, the at-onceness uh, has to be then Cezanne. We have to participate. And that comes up again over and over in Gapeser. So uh, how do we act in what Gapeser call, call wakeful presence? And this is the first one. And then there's one more and we're done. Uh, again, there be turmoil, unsettledness um, in the world. The dawn of the integral eruption is barely begun. Uh, we forget that the, the integral era, any era of civilization, is uh, 
is really a long-term thing. And we're, we're just open now. We're beginning uh, this process. Uh, maybe the inner goal began as uh, Makunas suggested with Nietzsche in that era. Uh, but certainly we're, we're beginning to get into the, the thick of it now. So um, the restlessness is giving authority. Um, did I? So uh, maybe we go, let me go back there again. Uh, there be turmoil un, and unsettledness. The dawn of the integral eruption has barely begun, and there is restlessness in our civilization. The restlessness is given authority, possibly the validity by McLuhan, but also by Schlein, who comments on the disruption of media and technology. One can wear media disrupt disturbances, the shifts over the last 200 plus years. We could go back to the uh, beginning of the, the railroad. We could go to the uh, telegram uh, about 1850. We could go on to the uh, telephone in Nietzsche's era, that was just beginning. Uh, and uh, certainly after the beginning of the, the start of the 20th century, radio in the 20s, TV beginning in the mid 40s. We had our first TV at home in 1949. And then uh, the internet and, and TV and all of those other media, which we have yet to have a hold on to, to stabilize uh, their, their implications and effects. So at the end of, of this book, The Problems of Philosophy, Bertrand, uh, Bertrand Russell suggests why we studied philosophy, why we studied games, or we could say. Above all, because through the greatness of the universe, which philosophy contemplates, the mind is also rendered great and becomes capable of that union with the universe, which constitutes its highest good. And I think Gabesler would say individuals and social groups can be consciously awake and participate and within the limits of the past and the expectations for the future, uh, we, could, we can encompass and, and integrate and bring into awareness just what uh, Bertrand Russell is saying, um, that we have to constitute the highest good. Um, okay, so thanks to the integral consciousness structure, all structures constituting us, the mental, magic, mythical, uh, magical, archaic, all becoming transparent to us and hence integratable. Uh, that was from the, the invisible origin. Um, and futurity, John mentioned this, grows out of me and I do not create it and yet I do. And I think that's a very important thing that, that Jung would put forth is that uh, the world lives me as much as I live the world, maybe more so. So two, the last uh, conclusion here, how do we act in what Gabes are called wakeful presence? One more time, we cannot realistically control the future. However, the forms and concomitant man manifestations indeed primarily dependent on us, the bearers of the mutation of the terrestrial plane. So we, the integrally aware, must be the bearers of the mutation a mutation that is ever present, encompassing all of the structures. What and how we do it? Nietzsche laid down his criteria, the eternal return of the same, taking the best of the past and the best of the future action to the fullness, into the fullness of the present. And what Nietzsche said by the, what, what he meant by the, the return, uh, the eternal return of the same, was that when we plan for the future in the now, uh, in the fullness of the present, we should act and think and, and participate in a way that we, would, we could live with if it happened over and over and over again. If we had to relive this event, this time, this moment, this presencing uh, of past and future, um, then we can go forward. If we can't, if we can't pass that criteria, uh, it doesn't float. So Jung, who fig figures large in, in Gabster's philosophy, um, writes of individuation, the ego-free self. And I think that's what we're talking about here. 
And it's very interesting that I think Jung has the most citations or references in Gapser's ever present origin. There are more than 50 references to Jung's work. So this kind of ties it all up into a nice uh, package, which is <laughs> tumbling. <laughs> all possibilities of mutation require discipline and aware selves with futurity as presencing arising from the integral uh, wakefulness and their actions created in sync with the spirit of the at ones. So there we end um, with that presencing with that molding of the past and the future and the now, and the fact that we must be, as Gapser would say, fully aware, wakefully present when we act and what we do and how we relate. So thank you. <laughs> All right, we have uh, some time for questions. Comments? Did I lose you? No. No, we're still oh. here. Okay. So quiet. <laughs> I, I have much to say, but I don't want to be the I don't want to be the first to say. I don't even know what I have to say, but I did take a lot of it. <laughs> I know a few things I have to say, but anyone else want to go? For oh, it? well, yeah, I'll, I'll start with just uh, something that that hit me during your talk, Mike, that like never hit me before, which is um, decadence, 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 yes, key, yes, cadencing. So, so cadencing is like the regular rhythms of life. And when you get out of those regular rhythms is, is when the, the turmoil, you know, the, the turmoil of decadence is, is getting out of the uh -huh. regular rhythms. Yeah, I think that, that strikes a chord and I, I've been dealing with that really. And, and Nietzsche was very much, uh, I don't know about Gapser, but Nietzsche was very much a, a creature of routine, right? That if he had that stability, the, the settledness, that he could, he had all the time to create. He wasn't disturbed because he knew what he was going to be doing, even though he didn't know what he what that was going to say or or how he was going to act. Yeah, very good. I, I think that's interesting. Yeah. Mike, I'd like to ask you a question. Okay. You mentioned uh, uh, the term concretizing. And I know that Gebser uses uh, the term uh, concretizing, and he says that the concretizing of the, of, the, uh, of the earlier modes of consciousness is not simply a mental awareness of uh, the other uh, modes of consciousness. And yet what Jung says is that concretizing is that, exactly that. It's the mental understanding of the other um, modes of consciousness, which precede, which precede uh, 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 ego consciousness or mental consciousness. So what, yeah. how, how would you explain that difference between the two? That's something that I've been wrestling with really for quite a bit of time, uh, uh, this idea of what exactly it means to concretize yeah I, I i'm not sure i can i can uh, fully grok that um, <laughs> to use an old term <laughs> but grok is a sense of of a more than an awareness of perception like there's a sixth sense right mm -hmm. and uh i am very much attuned to that at times and, and pick up on things right uh and i think that's where jung would be and Gapser would be concretizing is that things are real. We don't go off into imaginations of the ideal, which, which you know, except if we're, we're creating. And, mm -hmm. and in creation, that's fine. But as we live life, as we plan for the future, as we include the future in the present, right, it's got to be concrete, right? As he says about Cezanne, and, and uh, I forget who it was, Cezanne participated. John's out there doing his sculpture. <laughs> Does that help? 
Well, yeah, and that that that's that's adds to the whole concept. I was thinking more along the lines of of uh, how does one experience the concretizing of mythic consciousness, for example, when we're stuck in this era of the uh, deficient mode of mental consciousness? How does one go about that? Is that in dream? Is that uh, uh, a projection? Is that uh, a visualization of the sp- of, of the mythic and the spiritual in nature and in the world as you see it? I mean, there's there's a lot of different aspects to that, but I'm not quite sure what exactly what, what Gebser means by the term. Um, uh, by which term again? I, I, I uh, after listening to- This idea of concretizing, this idea of concretizing- Okay, you're still working example. with that. Yeah, yeah the, I think- the, the consciousness and, and and mythic consciousness, how do you- I think all of those, all of those, because you see how much uh, Gapser is is driven and and uh, led right by Jung, mm-hmm. and yet he has his own spin on it, so to say, right. And I think be, again, because this is about the project. I mean, you realize when Gapser was writing, I mean, the atomic bomb was, had been invented and had been used twice. Yeah. I mean, there was so much uh, to be grateful for that things were over, but we had to really uh, be concrete, not get off into to fascism and, and other dreams, right? And, and, no. and dreaming, dreaming has to be integrated too. I mean, that's a way to work with it. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, that's uh, Arnie Mandel, who I've worked with since the early 90s, is that you don't just uh, think about these things, you, you concretize them. You put them into the body and, and, and imagination and motion, right? That's very um, helpful. Thanks. Yeah. Can I, can I okay. uh, take a stab yep. at answering too? Um, so recently, Robert, um, in, in one of our Jung study groups, we came uh, in, in an, when he was discussing alchemy, he mm-hmm. repeated the the myth of Aristeus, and I won't repeat the whole myth, but you know, it it's it's an alchemical myth, um, you know, where uh, somebody has to go into the unconscious, and there's you know, um, there's a, a one uh, person engulfing the other person, and um, you know, it's it's really kind of a weird myth. Um, at, at about the same time, I was doing a lot of reading in biology on endosymbiosis, which is like how our bodies became what they are, um, by basically, um, cellular beings, you know, like our mitochondria in our cells used to be freely living organisms. Mm -hmm. Um, But they became engulfed and they still operate within our cells. They've got their own DNA. That's how we know that they used to be separate organisms. Their DNA is different than ours. Um, And the same with, I think, chloroplasts in, in plant cells. And it hit me it's like that's the myth of Aristeus. that's Bea and gabricus Bea, you know engulfing gabricus and and that really like when i had that aha you can start seeing some of those old myths playing out in how they tell the stories of science now you know, uh, endosymbiosis oh, okay. is entirely a scientific theory, but it's got the same kind of elements as that old myth. Um, oh, that's a good example. That's a really good example of the concretization. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Appreciate that. yeah. yeah good, just to note, uh, you, you use the term old myth. Uh, we could probably un- unpack that because in with with Gapser's uh, help we see myth is is neither old nor new 
uh, in that sense of, of its ever presence. Yeah, it's timeless. It's basically a story. So, you know, a myth is a story. And in the, the ninth century, they told the story using personification. Now we tell the story using, you know, cells and mitochondria and things like that. Yeah. And the concretization is the understanding of this of this relationship between the mythic and the and the science, between the, the mythic and the mental. Yeah, very that's, good. I like that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. That's that's to speak uh qu quickly, uh Robert. Uh yeah, yes, to get the commensurability of Gibster's language and Jung's language is, is not difficult, but it does take, uh, you know, some work. Jung is uh, calling to a concretion, by the way, Whitehead calls for a concrescence, concrescence, uh, but uh, it, just as Mike said, sort of an, an actuality and, and not drifting into various one-sided uh, uh, orientations or perspectives. Uh, but mm, Jung is point, yeah. Jung is calling for the the value of the e efficient mental, but Jung is also uh, calling profoundly for the value of the efficient mythic. Absolutely, uh, yeah. Jung does not have yeah. the term, and boy, I wish he did. And our Jungian community can benefit from this. And uh, but that is uh, the deficient mythic. Uh, Jung warns about the deficient mythic, but he doesn't have that language. Gapes would supply some useful language there. Uh, but the concretion, concrescence, uh, uh, does not choose sides, uh, but comes into this immediate uh, sense of, of reality, uh, so to speak. I'm getting in, I'm, I'm drifting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I, I, I also wanted to chime in and something that I'm going to try and speak to next week. But, um, you know, this this idea that we've sort of been under the spell of mental consciousness for a, a many, 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 many years. And, you know, you think it is back to 500 BC when it you know started coming into being and then with the Enlightenment and, and all of the philosophers, etc. And so, okay. you know, this idea of imagination, it's almost um, like in our um, in very strong mental orientation and maybe deficient mental consciousness, it's like almost a sin, right? To, you know, to daydream is a sin or, um, you know, to not be like focused and clear. And so, I, you know, I, I, I sort of feel it's, it's like a way for us to um, once again, allow, allow ourselves, give our, gives ourselves the, the right and the space and the kinds of lives where, imagination like you know <coughs> work in the garage it's like you know he's given himself space for to to be able to channel that so that it gets to be a part of his integrality right so i mean so that's kind of how i've been thinking about it yeah mm -hmm. so um do you want to take another short break uh, yeah, we're on. No, that's not the schedule. Um, oh, no. Uh, there actually is no coordinator at this conference. <laughs> I'm, I'm speaking <laughs> off.